I'm going to start with uh, uh, the same question to several of the panel members, um, which is sort of question number uh, one and three. I think we're going to leave the implementation research one for the general discussion uh, with the audience. But if I could start with, uh, with, with you, John, um, on question one and three. So is there a need for a more formalized approach to setting a global public health research agenda and a roadmap, a priority setting process? And if so, who should set it and, and how should it be set? And then linked with that, what do you see as the other key evidence gaps and, and public health research priorities? John, followed by uh, Jidong. Okay, thanks, Philip. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, well, I think we've, we've seen some um, um, information that really tells us that the um, hepatitis research agenda is um, underfunded and not as developed as it could be, uh, particularly at this um, point in um, uh, our response to hepatitis. And I, for me, I think from a public health perspective, uh, the, the research um, is needed to get the full benefit of interventions that have already shown themselves to be effective. And so are they being fully utilized? Uh, what are the gaps in your prevention efforts? And then that by identifying and recognizing those gaps, questions emerge as to how they can be addressed and those, that forms your basis of research. And then for me, thirdly on public health is, is the health equity issue. Are your interventions being uh, available to everyone um, equally so that everyone can benefit from the um, effective interventions um, to prevent transmission and disease? So, so I think there would be a, a value in having a global research agenda to identify, you know, these big questions that need to be answered to achieve those three goals. And I think any body, um, any organization, uh, global organization that is striving to develop normative guidance around prevention of transmission and disease has a prime opportunity to develop that research agenda. And so that uh, WHO you know, has that position um, at the global level. Um, public health, one of the powers of public health is the convening power where you, you have that um, sort of trans sector uh, reach to really bring multiple stakeholders together. And so that's why public health uh, you know, can have a pivotal role in developing recommendations and um, courses of action. And in those discussions, you should be uh, identifying these research questions that need to be answered. So that should really be a natural flow from your um, um, setting guidance and um, various action plans. So I think WHO does have a role in, um, in setting a global agenda, particularly identifying these big, big questions uh, that need to be answered. And it's particularly helpful, I think, because some of the uh, organizations that can help you answer those questions are multinational, whether they be uh, funders or, or industry or national agencies that have a mission of funding uh, research around the world. Um, um, and, uh, and then it also, I think, having a global research agenda helps national uh, organizations set priorities within their, within their countries uh, and helps you know, individual researchers have a frame of reference to uh, advocate for funding from, a, from national bodies or even academic institutions. And I think then lastly, I think the, the, on the health equity side, a, a global research agenda helps you um, um, foster research for uh, uh, you know, less developed uh, areas where the, where the research capacity um, is, um, is thin. Uh, and then by raising uh, those research agenda uh, questions to a higher level, you might, you get, you draw more attention to those and therefore uh, increase the opportunities for research and improvement in prevention for the, um, for those who have um, the least capacity. 
Great, thank you so much, uh, John. Um, so, Jidong, similar questions. Do we need to do something formal, or are the, the research issues largely being covered by researchers just defining uh, what the gaps are? And just to make your responses brief, uh, if you can. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Ward. Uh, I believe the WHO may organize, may uh, propose this project and also we may invite the national government or national CDC to have this. And uh, not only on the cost effectiveness analysis, but also on the so-called budget impact, because many countries like China, they understand antiviral therapy would be already confirmed to cost effective, but they worry about uh, the budget impact. They, they don't want to create a situation the, the out of control. So I think that's one important issue. Another issue specifically in China is, in general, we, we are still uh, resource limiting, limited countries, but at the same time, the, the uh, not optimized use, uh, how to say, uh, it's uh, unrationalized use of resources is also a big issue. So maybe one of the research gap is optimized uh, utilization of the resource. You mean we need to use what's really effective and we try to avoid what is ineffective, which is a, a big issue considering the, the current situation. Thank Thanks you. very much, Lidong. I'm now going to turn to, to Claire um, and then finish with, with Charles. So, Claire, I mean, based on the experience of now um, uh, um, uh, implementing projects, 21 projects in 11 countries, what are some of the lessons learned um, for what to do, what not to do in, uh, in uh, your collaborations and resource poor settings? Um, okay, well, um, one thing which is very uh, important and uh, with the HIV experience that we have for more than 20 years now is to have very strong um, multidisciplinary and international networks to work uh, on the project and come up with the question and proposition of uh, uh, new innovative ideas around the treatment, um, testing, prevention on uh, HIV and now on hepatitis. Those network already exist uh, in, the, in the country and one of the challenge would be to, uh, to have the hepatologist and people working on hepatitis sitting around the table with the existing network who already know very well the country and the situation of, uh, in, in the different countries where, where we work. Um, an another thing is, is very important also uh, to have a strong support from national program or health authority in order to implement the research um, uh, comfortably enough and uh, to assure to patient treat access to treatment even after the end of the research when it, it is necessary. So uh, we hope that the national programs uh, will, um, will emerge. It is already el evolving in the country. Um, and uh, maybe the last point that is also, uh, that, that was a limitation for ANRS to develop a research program was the lack of epidemiologic data on the, on, in the different countries because the, the, it, it was pointed out in, in this past um, two days uh, in different intervention. Um, the health authority, the Ministry of Health or national program are very hesitant to, uh, to engage into research pro project when they don't have a, a clear picture of their epidemic in their country. Unfortunately, at the ANRS level, which found the research project. Um, uh, the selection of those projects are very competitive and, um, and studies only looking at prevalence, not proposing intervention or access to care uh, are rarely accepted for funding at the NRS. So it's a big limitation to implement uh, the research. Thank you, Claire. Um, so moving swiftly to Charles. Um, uh, so what should be and could be 
the role of civil society in setting and implementing the research agenda as well as in advocacy for research funding. I suppose it's yes and yes. <laughs> and just brief so that we can open it up to the audience. Thanks, Charles. Uh, yes, no, I'll be very brief. But just to say, first of all, in terms of your first question there, I definitely think that uh, it's really important to set an agenda and for, for organizations like WHO to do it. And this was one of the driving factors behind the idea for this meeting was to provide a forum where that could happen. Because one of the things is, with resources so limited, we don't want to be duplicating things and we want to be clearly directing the resources at the big questions. And I think that to answer your question about civil society's involvement, it's so important. And I really want to say that our experience has been that civil society tends to get tacked on to research projects at a very late stage so that the research can say, yes, no, we're doing this in, in collaboration with, uh, with civil society, with the affected community. And actually, this is really not good enough. And we need to be involved right at the beginning. Actually, we need to be consulted. We need to have uh, input into to what the questions are. You know, very often it's things like psychosocial questions, you know, about stigma or whatever it might happen to be along that lines that largely get ignored and because we are not brought in at an early stage. And it's partly because clearly we don't have huge uh, time and personnel resources to lead on many of these questions. Thanks so much to all the panelists. So I think we just now have time for three or four very quick interventions, comments, um, uh, questions. Okay. Um, hello, uh, Philippa. Uh, thank you for Thanks, these presentations. Um, and then ben. I'm David Goldberg from Scotland. And uh, obviously, I mean, I have a long-standing interest in, in research and um, public health research in the area of hepatitis. It occurred to me, of course, that universities, the academic sector, uh, follows the money. Um, and that's, that's a, a critical um, uh, concept. Just a few miles from here, a few kilometers from here, is uh, a recently built um, center um, funded by the British Heart Foundation. Okay, it's a cardiovascular disease research center and it has drawn in people from all over the world. And indeed, the head of that research center now is uh, someone, uh, Rian Taus, from uh, uh, Toronto, uh, and she was brought over uh, to lead that um, uh, research center. Now, the British Heart Foundation, of course, is a charity. And uh, um, uh, cardiovascular disease is uh, pretty sexy in this respect, um, but uh, uh, it certainly draws in uh, millions and millions uh, of uh, uh, pounds. And we have the same for cancer, um, but I don't really see very much in the hepatitis area or liver disease um, area, perhaps uh, this area is not, is not particularly sexy. But I do think there is a place for some sort of charity um, uh, at a uh, national level, perhaps even an international level. I don't know, Charles, if there is uh, the possibility of this idea of maybe uh, um, uh, uh, an alliance um, uh, foundation for uh, research which could actually attract um, uh, benefactors to build up um, a war chest uh, for research. I think there is a gap here uh, and I would be interested in your uh, thoughts on this. Thanks very much, David. So endowment from, from somebody rich. Um, question over here. Thanks very much, Philippa, and thanks for a great presentation. It's a really important issue. Um, ben Cowie from the Doherty Institute in Melbourne. 
So I think, um, and, and you picked up on this point, implementation research, clearly there is much more that needs to be done. Uh, and one of the points you've got up there is really critical, I think, particularly from the public health and surveillance aspects. There's a lot of guidance coming out from WHO around surveillance systems and, and how to monitor the epidemic in different populations. And not only to look at burden of disease and number of cases, but correlates of response, such as uh, testing uptake, treatment provision, vaccination uptake, etc. So I'd like a comment on the, from the panel particularly on that issue, because when we, for instance, at our um, consultation in the Western Pacific region earlier this year, many of the member states had no idea about the different data sets that were currently being collected, that if they're actually drawn together at the national level, can inform without any additional expense or any additional resources on their local epidemic for viral hepatitis and correlates of the response to that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I think we're just going to take these quick comments here at the front. Hi, uh, my name is Serge. I'm with the Laotian American National Alliance in the US. Um, personally, I was born in Laos. I'm a US citizen now. I'm currently a Hep B patient for the past three years, been uh, treated at the California Pacific Medical Center. My uh, question, um, hearing all the panelists, is um, just wanted to know I heard uh, health equity issues, um, you know, most vulnerable communities, high impact communities, uh, optimized utiliz utilization of resource, resource limited countries. I've been following the hepatitis B specifically for the past decade. Um, and so I just wanted to know um, what areas, uh, what, what, what is who and also uh, N ANRS, is, is Laos on the map uh, in your programs? Um, I know that in Laos specifically, um, it's not a vaccine issue, but it's more of access issues because most births are not done in the hospitals. Uh, in the U.S., the number one cause of liver cancer uh, for Laotian is, well, number one cause of death for Laotian is liver cancer, uh, directly related to hepatitis B. And um, just observing that community in the U.S., it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, Compared to all the Asian groups in the U.S., we are the most vulnerable, um, but resources, uh, I have not seen any resources um, myself. In terms of advocacy, um, I don't know too many Laotians in, in America or anywhere besides myself at the moment that advocates for Hep B for my community. So uh, if there's anyone out there, please let yourself be known. I'll be happy to work with you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one other quick intervention. Uh, yes, please, at the table here. And then I think we do need to wrap it up and do a fast exit from the hall to the next sessions. Hi. Saeed Hamid from Karachi, Pakistan. I'm, uh, if anything, I'm a quantitative researcher, so this goes against the grain what I'm going to ask you. On your uh, three points, what was missing was the, a study, a global study, on the impact of viral hepatitis on the human condition. And what I mean by the human condition is the economic condition, the social condition, the family condition, whatever. We don't have any data for that. Do we know how many kids get out of school because the family has to pay for the, for the, uh, for, for the father to be, to, to be? How many people downgrade their social status once the chronic liver disease expenditures have to be paid or even the treatment expenditures have to be paid? I think this is a crucial area because of lack of information in this area, we have not been able to make the economic case to our ministries, to our governments, to our, to our big funders, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, uh, I think we have one minute left. I think we do need to finish the session before we drag kicking and screaming from the stage. So I'd like to thank all the uh, panelists and the contributions from the audience. I think uh, uh, clear messages that we've got low level funding, particularly compared to HIV, uh, the need for perhaps some uh, new initiative for, uh, for funding, um, some support for formally setting a research 
research agenda um, and the need to address sort of implementation and, and gather existing data sources that can be used and the important question of looking at the impact, the economic impact on the human condition and the critical role of civil society and community. So thank you all again. I think we need a longer session next time. Um, so on to the next uh, parallel session. Thanks so much.